Um, I can't tell you guys how excited I am about this workshop. <laughs> it's like something I've been looking forward to for quite some time. And I think the fact that all of you are part of it makes it really special. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, in case I don't know you already, um, I'm Jeanette Kim. I am assistant professor here at CCA, California College of the Arts. And um, I've organized this workshop and this conference um, with Antje Steinmiller. Um, maybe you could wave. <laughs> Hi everybody, taking very little credit. It's really Jeanette's amazing work that you're seeing here. <laughs> um, and Niraj Batia has also co-organized this and he's on childcare duty so he'll be kind of popping in and out today. And then Chris Roach, if you could wave, um, is also our um, co-director of Urban Works Agency, which is a research lab that we all run together and that's organized this event. Um, so, and then there are a kind of a couple of other relationships that might be useful for you to know about. Um, uh, this whole symposium is related to two courses that Antia and I are teaching. Um, one is um, Antia's seminar, which is called um, Framing the Commons, Architectures of Collective Production and Reproduction. And then the other class is my design studio, which is called Property and Crisis. Um, and so a lot of my students, the students in my in my group have created a lot of the research and the imagery that we'll be playing with today. Um, and we are so lucky to be working in our studio with Noni Session at East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, hi Noni. Um, and we're, we'll be focusing in on West Oakland and the 7th Street Corridor later this semester. Um, so that a lot of this work will influence that process. All right, so I think as you probably all know from looking through the materials, I think the big overarching premise, right, like the bigger goal of this um, workshop is to tackle what property has meant and what property could mean. And I think in so many ways property has like, you know, it's created profit, it's extracted land from others, it's kind of generated this speculative market around the land. Um, but property has also really tied us together as communities. It forms bonds of kinship and community and um, forms relationships of reciprocity between animals and land and resources, right? Um, and I think it's really within the spirit especially that I'd like to acknowledge um, CCA's presence on Huichin and Yelamu land um, within the unceded territories of Chochenyo and Ramatish Ohlone peoples. And I think it's really within the spirit that I hope we can all together rethink what property and relationships and ownerships to land might mean. Um, so if that's kind of the biggest goal, I think the particular um, interest within this, within this um, workshop, sorry, I just realized that my cat is like enclosed in this room. <laughs> oh, I'm just gonna let her out. Um, but particular to this workshop, um, I think one thing we were really excited about was this opportunity to connect people who think and work strategically, meaning people who are, are sort of working with activist um, practices, um, people who deal with economic incentives or policy making or legal strategies, and to bring that body of knowledge um, and that very complex range of different kinds of expertise into design and to cross over between those languages. Um, so it's, it's very much for that reason that we've um, invited our, our, what I'm calling today, I'm calling strategists, but we could also call it maybe guest critics or speakers today. And um, I think every single one of these people is both a kind of very inventive and visionary big picture thinker um, and someone who is very much working on the ground realizing very unique kinds of practice. Um, so I have um, all of the bios of our guests, of our strategists um, in the event webpage. Um, and I'm still doing screen sharing, is that correct? Um, so if you go over here and click up here, you can see the full bios of those people. Um, but for now, I was wondering if um, we could ask all of the strategists to please um, tell us your name and maybe say like a, you know, one to two sentence kind of introduction. Um, and maybe we could just go alphabetically through the list. Um, so Alex, can we start with you? 
Yeah, how's it going, everybody? Thanks for having me here. My name is Alex Acuna. I work with Enterprise Community Partners. We're a national affordable housing nonprofit, and I work um, in the Northern California office. Um, and I work on our Democratizing Resilience and Disaster Recovery Initiative. And um, so I focus mainly on um, building out tools, resources, and strategies to help community-based organizations, local governments, and philanthropy better plan for and recover from um, current and future disaster um, events and um, really trying to embed um, kind of alternative uh, housing models in this process um, to help make it easier to um, expand both the access to traditional affordable housing, but also um, more collective models of affordable housing. Thanks, Alex. Um, Billy's not here, so Adam, um, if you could say a few words. Sure. Um, thanks, Jeanette, for inviting me to this. It's awesome to be here um, and to see many students where, uh, where I, I co-direct the Architectural Ecologies Lab. Um, and my expertise is really um, um, trained as an architect focused on kind of material innovation um, through computational design, digital fabrication. But um, through the work with the lab, um, really focused on developing um, and prototyping uh, forms of cohabitation um, between humans and, and animals, not humans. Um, so I'm interested in kind of that um, overlap with this conversation. Um, I also uh, have a practice outside of CCA, um, largely through public artworks, um, looking at ways that of visualizing and spatializing ecological data um, to a larger public. So, thanks. Perfect. Eric. Hi, great to be with you all. Uh, my name is Eric Rogers. Um, I'm a PhD student here at the University of Cambridge. I'm here in England. Um, but my background is in, uh, oh, I should say, uh, I'm researching right now social and urban histories um, of pleasure. Um, and the way that sort of spatial and social uh, structures have weighed upon and made artificially scarce um, pleasure. Uh, I have a background though in design. I used to study at CCA um, and then went on to Yale to study um, architectural history and theory, uh, where I also looked at sort of social and spatial intersections in my research. Um, and I also have a sort of activist practice. I was uh, heavily involved in the San Francisco commune movement I'm a member of the Embassy Network, uh, which is a sort of federation of communes in San Francisco that's basically federated all the communes of San Francisco uh, into like one larger sort of block. Um, and I also ran a series on um, imminent urbanisms a few years ago. It was quite a few years ago now, um, but that sort of went on to inform various sort of activist practices of occupying space and sort of bypassing the like artificial scarcity in pleasure that's designed into our built environment. So that's sort of uh, my background. Awesome. Colleen. Nick Pashwe, Kwathlanam Wianawi, Inish Manisha, Colleen Sanders. Um, so good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am the climate adaptation planner for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in the First Foods Policy Program in the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, I have the really distinct honor of being able to um, try and anticipate climate change impacts to the tribe and the tribe's interests. And to do this, um, everything that the tribe does is centered around the first foods, the food, the indigenous food system that has kept and sustained people healthily in North America for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and so our adaptation planning really seeks to uphold the indigenous food system above the colonizer frameworks that other adaptation plans might choose to prioritize. And um, I, it's important for me to always note that I am not a tribal member. And so part of my work in all of this has been to actively decolonize within myself and within the way that we interact with land. Uh, and so that's been really a wonderful journey 
and a really wonderful way to look at the world. Uh, I've been working in food systems uh, for quite some time, for about a decade now. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in wildlife ecology from the University of British Columbia and my master's degree in community food systems from Washington State University. And I was really interested in the intersection between wildlife conservation and food production, which for the tribe is the same thing. And so uh, I'm really excited to be here talking about land and commons and maybe better ways to look at the way that we interact with the land, especially from an indigenous rights and indigenous land management perspective. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Colleen and Noni. Hi, I'm Noni Session. I'm the executive director of the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, I'm also a third generation West Oaklander and um, this current uh, work that we're talking about um, relates to our mission of uh, supporting um, Black, Brown, Oaklanders in um, finding, acquiring, um, financing, long-term stewarding, um, collectively owned land and housing, also building out um, an internal cooperative uh, model of governance conflict resolution, et cetera, um, so as to um, be one of the major inputs in creating um, durable um, community-based, community-led organizations um, that have some stability so that they can continue to build generationally instead of every generation sort of scrabbling to recover from the losses um, due to absence of access to um, inexpensive capital, access to technical assistance, um, access to um, non-extractive um, relationships with the organizations that support that vision. Um, so, yes. Thanks, Noni. And Maya. I see that her camera is Maya right there. Sorry, technical difficulties on this end. We've got about three of us using about 14 different um, devices this morning. Uh, Maya Small with the San Francisco Planning Department. I'm uh, hustling for a noontime uh, commission uh, submission. Uh, <laughs> so sorry, I've got a, a little thing going on in the background for the moment. Um, but I'm uh, an architect, an urban designer by training, a licensed architect, and I've been running the urban design team. Um, at the San Francisco Planning Department for the last few years. I'm currently taking a hiatus from that role. Um, so that role is primarily looking at kind of comprehensive urban design within the city. It encompasses things like design review. It encompasses, you know, um, contributing to different forms of policy, both kind of short-term entitlement, but also long-range uh, policy uh, kind of across the department. Um, but I'm taking a hiatus right now and so that I can join what is a, a new community equity division within the department. And within that division, and, and that's really intended to center our work on racial and social equity, so that that is embedded within everything that we do. Um, and so I'm now leading a team called the Policies and Strategies Team, which includes some long range looks at, at our housing policy in particular. It includes the housing element update, which is happening with the general plan, um, recovery strategies, so our response to our current situation of not only COVID, but obviously the wildfires, the climate. Um, crisis and, um, you know, even enhancing all of our aspects of structural racism that we, of course, are deeply embedded within our systems. Um, so we're sort of trying to tackle a lot within a, you know, as immediately as we possibly can, working with the mayor's office and the board of supervisors. So that's happening quite, um, quite urgently. Um, and then also uh, taking on the cultural districts. So really looking at, at housing policy within the framework of the, the nature and specific and urgent needs of our vulnerable populations in particular and a lot of our historically underserved communities. Perfect, thank you all so much for being here. I'm so excited to see how this conversation goes today. Um, basically the way that we're going to organize ourselves in terms of teams is that, as I mentioned, there are these six strategists and then everybody else in the room, for the most part, is a, what I'm calling a designer. And that could be students at CCA. And we also have a couple of guest um, students from other institutions. So welcome to them, especially. Um, and the way it will work is that um, Antia is setting this up right now. We basically have six teams throughout the day. 
every designer is part of one team and you'll stay with that team throughout the afternoon. Um, all the strategists will be part of two different teams um, in different groupings so that hopefully it's kind of fun for you to be able to work with different people in the various teams. So there are A teams, which are here, um, and then there are B teams, which are organized here. And the way that works is that um, in around 1220 or maybe a little bit later, um, the strategists will meet with their A teams. Um, we have separate Zoom links that you can see here in the blue um, little text over here. So you can pop over at, um, in a few minutes over to your A team sessions. Does that make sense? So all the strategists will meet with their A teams around 12.20 p.m. And then at that time, if you're in a B team, you can go ahead and get started with that group and just meet each other and hang out and think about how you might want to work together. Um, and then at 12.40, I'll ask all the strategists to pop over to their B teams. Um, you, again, you'll use the Zoom links that are located here um, to find your people in those locations. Um, and then um, um, you'll have a chance to meet back with those same groups again. So I'll show you in a second, but roughly at one o'clock, um, I'll ask the strategists to go back to the A team and check in with them and offer any feedback if they'd like. And then also at 1.20, the strategists can go meet with the B teams. And then we'll all get back together again at two o'clock um, and share back what everyone has done and discussed and hopefully have a more general conversation. All right, so that's sort of the organization of things. And I apologize to the strategists if that's a little chaotic. Um, I hope that it's uh, advantageous that you can see different other strategists and kind of open up these conversations that way. All right, so that talks a bit about the structure, generally speaking. Um, now I'd just like to reinforce what it is that we're doing today. So what I'm asking of you is for each team to please envision a, what they consider to be a more equitable and more inclusive approach towards arranging property. So that's, the, that's essentially the goal. Um, and then what we're going to do, as I just mentioned, is we're going to divide the afternoon into these three steps. So the first is to define a strategy for each team for how you might envision, sort of, you know, name and actually um, arrive at this particular property idea. So this is the strategy sequence. And I'm hoping that the strategists will really take a lead here. Um, although I'm sure that your conversations will be quite collaborative. We especially want to hear your perspective on what kinds of property types you think are promising and what it might take to actually get there. Um, so that's the first segment. The second segment is more focused on design. And here I think the designers will, again, take the lead while still working collaboratively. Um, and here, um, what we're asking of you is to please visualize your property type spatially and create one image that shows how this property might be inhabited or experienced. Um, so, um, let me walk through these steps. And then, as I said, then the last hour will be to share back. So maybe I'll walk through these steps just one at a time and maybe also give a couple of examples. So first, let's just talk about how strategy might work, right? And I think all of you have looked at this, which is basically what I'm calling the playbook archive. Um, so if we think of play as like a series of plays that like any person could use to realize, you know, new kinds of property. Um, as you can see, we have all of these different property types listed on the top. And then we've break, broken that down a little further into questions of like governance, economy, sociability, environment, risk, and space. Um, but you can also keep it general if you prefer. But regardless, I think the most important thing you should know is that all of these different cards that are noted here, um, as well as the blank cards over here, define possible strategies around um, property. Um, so let's just say, for example, that I am in, let's say I'm Adam and I'm in this team. And so as I sort of join in with Colleen in the Zoom room, I might say, okay, I'm just gonna grab a couple of cards that especially interest me, right? Like I maybe I'm really interested in um, maybe I'm really interested in the way that vacancy can create sociability, which is what this card talks about. 
So I'm just going to grab this card and copy it. Just go like Command C or copy and paste in the menu. And then I'm going to copy that card and then place it down here inside where my group is working. And then let's say, well, let's say I'm Colleen, for example, and then I might say, well, I'm actually interested in an idea that's not on this playbook. So I'm going to just grab some kind of card over here on the side. And again, I'll copy it and then paste it and put it in here. And um, like, like maybe by double clicking on it, you can edit it. So maybe she could say, for example, like I want to, <laughs> um, let's, let's um, divide up property into smaller lots that are affordable. I'm not sure that Colleen would say that, but <laughs> um, let's say that that's her, this idea. So she can go ahead and place that in here. And you can do like more than two, right? But just sort of get, get the conversation started. And then as you go through this first 20 minute session with your A team or your B team, you might say like, oh, actually these don't work very well together. Let's grab another card instead, right? Or like, huh, you know, I didn't think these two cards went together, but I can see that they might actually be beneficial if we did it this way, right? So mostly I'm hoping that within this first 20 minute session, the um, strategists can basically together come up with an idea for how this property type might work. Um, and then if we go on to the design sequence over here, um, I've given a few more clues down here. Uh, maybe for the sake of time, I won't fully go through all of this right now. Um, but the important thing I'd like you to know is that um, what we're, I'm really asking you to create is one image of this property. And you please use that image to envision how it might be inhabited, how it might be fun, desirable, or just interesting in some way. Um, once you make that image, you can then please place that in this little space over here. Um, my students have all started this process within their own studio work. And what we've done here is um, I've actually given my students this kind of like abstract grid. <laughs> so there's no site or scale yet, but instead what we wanted to do was study the spatial boundaries, the arrangements, the relationships that property ideas could suggest. So we started at pretty, pretty abstractly. Um, and you can see here that there are ideas that my students have all come up with that relate and align to the property type that's described up here. Um, so you are more than welcome to use these materials. You can rescale them, cut them apart, recombine with something else. You can do whatever you want with these models, or you can completely start again. Um, it's totally up to you, however you want to do that. Um, these are all mostly in Rhino, and if you wanted to open them up, you can go to this Google Drive over here and um, basically open up the files and access them there. But I, I definitely don't, I really want this to be up to all, all of you. If you prefer to just hand draw, you can hand draw, right? If you would prefer to just work in Photoshop um, by collaging materials together, that's just as great. Okay, so the Rhino models are really just there if they're useful. And for the people who are in my studio, I hope that you feel free to, you know, please don't feel obligated to use your materials, right? Like it, the, the point is to really proliferate ideas here. Um, okay, so when I say that um, I'm asking you to identify and visualize this possible property proposal, um, you're more than welcome to keep it pretty abstract. You know, it could be like a generic condition. Like imagine that these are backyards and this is how it would work. Or imagine that this is a watershed and this is how it would work. Or if you prefer, you could use a very specific condition. In that case, I've actually dropped a, a little map of West Oakland in Rhino into the same Google Drive. So if you, if you prefer to be really specific, you're welcome to use that as a baseline as well. Okay, I hope that's not too general, but um, you have options. <laughs> um, okay, um, maybe I'll say a few logistical things as well. Um, what I've done is um, we've all ident like kind of pre-sorted and, and assigned you all to a different group. I placed an asterisk next to people who I'd like to be team coordinators. If you are a team coordinator, could you please just sort of be a timekeeper? Um, 
and just say, oh, you guys, we might want to switch over to drawing now, or we might want to, you know, Noni, you have five more minutes before you need to move on to the next session, you know. Um, so if you could please be, be timekeepers, maybe you could also, you know, re be responsible for screen sharing and organizing any files if we need to. Um, so I would really appreciate that. Um, secondly, um, the way it's going to work in terms of Zoom links is that this Zoom link right here is the one that we're all in right now. So we'll meet back here at two o'clock. Um, these Zoom links, which are associated with each team, um, are um, just up here. <laughs> um, I'm myself going to migrate. I'll just roam around. So if you need to find me, um, you can just text me at my phone number and I'll come find you or just send a, a note back. Um, lastly, um, in terms of Zoom recording, um, what we're going to do is we're going to live stream the conversation at 2 p.m. Um, and um, record that session. Um, but if anybody has any reservations about that, please just don't hesitate to let me know because that's a, a relatively low priority. Um, I'm also, I've also set up all of these individual team Zooms to auto record. Um, especially because I would really like to be able to, my, me and my students, to be able to go back and see what Maya might have said, you know, in the 1220 session or to really understand the strategists' conversations. But if there's ever a time where you would prefer to just un, not record, or especially when you're working in the teams and it's more casual, um, feel free to just turn that off if you prefer to do that. It's really your choice. Um, Okay, are there any, oh, sorry, one more thing. And I actually think this is maybe the most important thing. Um, I think getting a number of people who don't know each other from very different disciplines together for a very, very quick project <laughs> can be, it's, it takes time, right? It takes time to build that like shared language, to hear each other out and really to you know, unpack what we all think about. And so I hope that all of you feel like you can prioritize the process over the product, right? Like it doesn't matter so much, right? Whether the, there's a mo perfect model or a particular kind of image. I think we're all really here to just talk with each other and to use this as a collaborative process. So I, I hope that you would please keep that in mind. Um, also, I know that I've set up a lot of like rule sets and directions and all this stuff. Feel free to use ignore some rules if you want to, right? Um, I think, again, it's, it's in the spirit of being explore, uh, exploring. All right, um, do you all have any questions? Is it relatively clear? <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, we're just, we are gonna get together, the strategists, and talk through an idea based on some of the ideas that are on here and other ideas that we have. And then the design team will take that and make it a physical thing. Precisely. Okay. And then when you return at the one or one, one o'clock or one twenty sessions, that's a nice opportunity for you to say like, hmm, you could maybe also do this or like that kind of concerns me. Or, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for, for you all to kind of recombine your ideas as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. I hope this is fun. Thank you again. I'll see you around. <laughs>
we thought basically we could take the rest of our time together to share back the conversations that you've had and um, any design sketches and strategies you've had the opportunity to develop. Um, so I don't know if you all saw my chat, but I think it might make sense for every team coordinator um, to report back to the group. Um, if you could do that in three minutes, I know that's an extremely short amount of time, but three minutes would be amazing. And then that would still give us enough time to talk as a group to kind of reflect back, pull out themes that we're seeing, and then kind of close up the conversation. Um, is that okay? Cool. Um, so why don't we start with, um, let's just go from left to right and start with um, Donna, um, who um, is part of the first group. Hi, uh, I'm Donna and I let, we were the coordinator for um, A1 and we were looking at the PREC model, which is a combination of CLT and microfinancing. And we found that to be a very interesting way of managing um, you know, providing the community long-term affordable property and land, but also giving the individuals in that community um, financial, financial independence and provide and creating a more a stronger econo economic environment for them to thrive on. And this idea of, you know, redefining what private land and private property means for the community. And in this model, the privatization of land is no longer kept for just the individual whose name is on the lease, but rather it is given back to the community for, you know, to, to provide an ambience and a neighborhood that is more collective, that unifies different members of the community and creates a more engaging environment. So in our little collage, you can see how we emphasize the house to the left. And in this property, we wanted to you know, show the various activities and kind of the spirit that this private property can provide, not just for the members of that household, but for the community at large. And in our collage, we have them offering up their front yard for a farmer's market that people can come in during the week and pick up some, some good produce. And our little captions there say that there's a concert going on, the, going on in the backyard. Um, so having, uh, dividing the property into different segments and different areas of use and activity becomes a way to reinvigorate the community and not only um, create a more engaging area of the city, but it's a way to really emphasize community. And we wanted to show that in this in this operation. And if Kevin and Craig have anything to say, um, feel free to jump in. Uh, no, I think Donna summed it up really well. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, let's go on to the next group. Um, Sander, do you want to start? Yes. Uh, so Adam and uh, Colleen started entering these, you know, with everything going on recently. Um, Colleen mentioned it as the biblical threats of 2020. So like the floodings and the fires and all these kind of stuff we've seen. Uh, and we started talking about um, the quick summary we got was kind of like civilization following uh, the paths of nature and not the other way around. So um, let go of this idea of like permanent infrastructure that humans have and maybe look at the way nature is moving by flooding and, and all these kind of things uh, and follow that. Uh, and then we talked about um, following the food. We talked about food as an equity. Um, but what we kind of ended up in was this idea of uh, a river uh, and the settlement around this river and how one is sometimes flood. Uh, and you can see it on the, if you zoom in a little bit, thank you. Um, on the far side, there's a flooding, they're packing up, they're getting out of the way to move somewhere else. And then on the, near side everything's good there's a house up they're chilling on the sun beds uh just kind of they're they're good for now um yeah that was our uh, presentation super interesting and shout out to my team i think they were awesome 
like Asa said, action packed, but uh, yeah, they were great to work with. Thanks, Xander. Thanks, Asa. Thanks for Chaitanya as well. Thank you. Yeah, we gave Chaitanya, like, I think, three minutes in the end to pull everything <laughs> together. Uh, <laughs> But he, he pulled through really, really, really well. <laughs> At two thirty in the morning nonetheless. <laughs> exactly. Um, thank you. I have this crazy noise uh, for the construction. So maybe um, if you guys could just go ahead and you know the next person can can join on. Um, that way I, I don't have to uh, make so much noise. So maybe Marion, you're next. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Marion. Um, yeah. So our group we did talk about we started talking about um temporary uses and how um in especially in times of crisis like covid um there's a lot of creativity forming around uh temporary use and that a lot of uh jurisdictions that you might normally have to go through in order to um in order for a project to actually happen um kind of drop their um the, the rules that you would have to go through and and you end up being able to um, to uh, develop more quickly um, and so we talked about a um, concept of what we're calling it green a green lining overlay um, and that would be to uh, kind of especially in in areas where um, that have felt the the impact of redlining historically um, would be to have this overlay that would um, in times when there wasn't crisis um, to continue this um, ease of instead of having to go through all of these different jurisdictions that um, Maya listed quite a few that I, I wasn't aware of um, you could actually just go through uh, this green lining overlay um, and they would be able to help you assist you in in attaining land or just the opportunity to um, host uh, either develop on a on a land that you wouldn't have normally been able to in the past or to host some sort of event um, in a space that you normally wouldn't have been able to um, and so these are uh, some examples of we talked about um, with Chris um, how this tends to happen in uh, spaces where there's a gap in jurisdiction or like a gap in in the protocol of what how that space can be treated so examples might be a freeway a space under a freeway um, where technically that might be owned by Caltrans but there's no there's no um, discussion about how to utilize that space a lot of the time uh, maybe uh, an alleyway um, that's not really a valuable uh, space, but could be really valuable to like a pop-up business. Um, and then there's also spaces where there's an overlap in jurisdiction, uh, like public streets, um, and that you, you, those are spaces that might be a little bit more difficult to go through and um, uh, to work with. And yeah, um, so we actually focus more on, on um, like the gap type of spaces, so freeway and alley. Um, yeah, so that's what we have here on our board. <laughs> cool, hey, hey everybody. Uh, we had the uh, the second session with Noni and Maya. Um, <clears throat> we didn't really get to produce any sketch, so it's really just jam-packed with conversations, like really deep conversations, but I think uh, since Maya's not here, I think her overall message to us was uh, basically having precincts or neighborhoods kind of <laughs> express their concerns and have them become a part of the, uh, not necessarily the problem, but the solution. And I think Nonia was also getting into that and um, Savannah's gonna give us a, a good sentence yeah. about that. We have, we have kind of like an idea sketch just because we were discussing the sort of circular nature of organizations that benefit communities and then those communities also providing input and benefiting the organizations to 
uh, create this like circular cycle of teaching and learning. Uh, so ideas, organizations, and measures that aim to benefit communities must also be served by these communities in order to maximize the benefit and to create a circular relationship of growth and development. And then also um, just a final point by Noni, which I think is super important that uh, the core of decision-making power must be held by those who are most affected by that decision-making. Because we were particularly discussing how to navigate like collectivity and communal spaces. Okay, so our group um, is, is um, was discussing about the uh, spatial design inspired by pandemic. And then we're proposing um, the idea of um, the abandoned retail uh, office. Can this space turn into the um, housings or is any kind of use to reuse the space? And then the second idea is to introducing wilderness in the cities and and um, for people who would like to access, maybe it's a garden or park. So Brenton, Brenton and Gitika will explain the Rhino model and put in additional information. Okay, so <clears throat> the model is just kind of showing, uh, instead of, so one of the ideas that uh, came up, which was I thought was really strong, was instead of bringing trees and the wilderness literally back into the city, you bring the wild back into the city um, with a focus on creating moments of pleasure, adventure, and tranquility within the city. And so that's kind of where we get all these uh, bridges to nowhere. Um, these spaces that are green are meant to be the, the wilder parts of the city. Was swimming pools, trampolines, just pockets of fun everywhere, and a little bit of chaos and wildness to the city. And then you've got your um, offices that then turn into more housing developments for those people to inhabit. I might add we had like three minutes to put this together. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> we get the last group. Kyle, that's you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, okay. Um, so we had a dis. You can hear me. Okay. Yeah, we had a discussion about. Um, I guess first, um, and how indigenous land management was really defined by the the landscape that already existed and how food was um, cultivated by the landscape. Um, and uh, that sort of how, and how that created a ecological model. Um, and what we focused on was how could we reclaim land through crumbling infrastructure that currently exists like in the modern city um, and could things like the public land trust um that has taken um privately owned land back into like federal ownership and how that can translate into indigenous ownership um because and the argument would be that the indigenous um population already knows how to uh, maintain the land through their traditional practices um and then we sort of ended on you know the note saying that we obviously we can't go back strictly to um, uh, the indigenous practice because the colonial methods have already are deeply ingrained into the land. So how can we hybridize sort of the colonial methods and indigenous methods of land management um, to create a win-win situation um, and create a more resilient landscape? And we didn't really have time to create an image um, because the conversation was pr pretty thorough, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. 
Fabulous. Uh, really, congrats to all the groups for your beautiful work. Um, and also, I think the students like you presented back so eloquently. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, so I think really the floor is anyone's, right? Um, is there anybody who'd like to raise questions or you know tease out any themes that you're seeing emerge? There was um, one statement, I forget who, who made it exactly, but um, I was also leading that discussion. And the statement that stood out to me was, core of decision-making power should be made by those inhabiting the space. And I think that's very, um, it's very powerful and it resonated a lot with me, especially with, you know, um, where we are right now, you know, our political climate, the news, um, and everything that's been going on the last few weeks and months, uh, I think that statement is more powerful and more important than ever. Um, and I think it's great that urbanists and designers are having that, dis having these discussions and can, we can sympathize with this um, unanimously. And, um, you know, as designers, how can we um, encourage this sort of mentality to um, the people calling the shots or the, the, the big decision makers. And I wonder how we in this profession can um, exercise that power and, you know, implement it. Um, just to add, that was Noni's statement. I just had the pleasure of restating it. Yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a great statement. I really appreciate yeah. it. We ended on it. It was a good note. <laughs> I think that's a good question, Donna. I think, um, you know, but we also have to be cautious of the flip side of that, which is that oftentimes the people that are there are exercising that power to keep other people out. You know, that, that the, um, you know, the, the practices of redlining um, and racial discrimination are often cloaked in um, uh, people's passions around and, and connection to place and their desire to keep that place the same and keep people that are like them out. Um, so I just, I wanna, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think we have to as, as you know, as designers and, and as, um, you know, uh, actors who are um, engaging with, you know, both the, you know, levers of power, but also, you know, trying to um, situate our practices in community and in, and in, you know, listening and learning from the people who, you know, we affect. I think we have to understand, you know, sometimes there's, uh, some things are not as simple as they might seem. You know, the, the idea of local control or the idea of, of um, community character has both a positive and a negative side to it. So we always have to keep those things in context. I thought I might just touch on a couple of themes that I noticed came up in, I think both the groups I was in, um, which is on the one hand, crisis sort of suspending normal in really interesting ways. Um, so the way that top down rules and regulations and sort of jurisdictional protocols um, start to soften and uh, in their place, not totally replacing them, but mapped on top of them are all sorts of provisional, experimental, temporary, and we might even say prefigurative spatial uses and practices. Um, so that seems like definitely something that um, a lot of people are thinking about and it came up in both groups. Uh, the other one that came up that's related to this uh, crisis suspending normal is just, just that there are massive migrations I think happening right now, we don't know the, the scale of it, uh, but it's clear that it's quite dramatic. Um, people who can work from home leaving cities, um, that altering the prices of real estate in cities. Um, also this mass vacancy that um, is occurring both in storefronts and in offices um, seems to be, it seems like these migratory patterns and the real estate changes and these um, 
these shifts in uh, in in vacancies or these massive vacancies, um, they all demand like an overall strategy. And I think um, our second group was looking, you know, at how do you how do you come up with like a regional strategy for for sifting through these moving parts? You can no longer see think of the architectural site as a self enclosed um, lot that doesn't have to deal with its surroundings is very much contextual and situated in all these changing circumstances. And so I think that context becomes super important and something that designers and architects can really manage because we think spatially, um, but also socially. Um, so I, yeah, those are some themes that came up in our groups. I was curious to ask you all about that as well, because um, I, I can see very much that there are these increasing vacancies that the real estate market is less, I think, less hot in the city and in San Francisco Bay at least. Um, but I've also been hearing, you know, some some reporters, for example, saying that that narrative is being overhyped, right? That there's almost like a schadenfreude of excitement about the the story of the loss of the city, right? That there's this like return to, let, let's say, 60s era, um, kind of retreat of wealthy white residents from the city, kind of characterizing the city in a certain way, right? And that some of the discussions about vacancy in the city now are returns of that um, narrative that might not actually be true. Um, so anyway, I'm just kind of curious about what crisis narratives um, we find both convincing, meaning that they might be likely to happen, but also compelling or problematic in the way that they signal what we think cities are, how we imagine cities. I should say that um, I don't know that, I think the jury's still out on what's gonna happen with the residents of cities, whether they're actually gonna opt for, you know, country living, which is so popular right now while the pandemic is still raging. But of course, you know, once the pandemic is over, you still might wanna live near your friends and where the nice nightclubs and restaurants are and all the other things that people appreciate about cities, those, those will still be there. But I think the commercial, um, the commercial properties and commercial spaces, that does seem to be um, pretty unarguably altering in a very dramatic way. So the office spaces um, and the retail spaces, and we don't quite know how that's all gonna land, but it, it seems clear that that will be dramatic. That's my own uh, reading of the situation. It's interesting to hear you guys talk about um, migration away from the city because I, I wonder if maybe I'm the only person here that would be classified as a rural resident um, because the narrative around the exodus of the cities for less populated areas because of the pandemic is I think going to be really short lived because encroachment into the wildland urban interface causes all kinds of other problems where you might flee the city to get away from the pandemic and find your little cottage in the forest, but then that forest burns down and you're experiencing a different set of problems. Uh, and so I think the two really kind of balance out or we will maybe see them balance out. And California right now seems to be this experiment happening kind of in that push and pull because you're experiencing both the pandemic and these really dramatic uh, natural events that um, we're, are gonna keep happening, whereas the pandem pandemic will eventually end. So it's really good that we're having these conversations and I, I wonder how it will all play out. And maybe for Noni and Alex, um, and, and I know that, you know, the East Bay, uh, Ibi Prak has just gone through a scenario planning sequence of workshops, right? Trying to envision how the real estate market might shift, for example, how um, there might be either opportunities or pressures that are resulting from the coronavirus crisis. Um, and Alex, I'm, I'm involving you in this question because I know you are also involved in that scenario planning process. So for Alex and Noni, are there certain scenarios that you have seen within that process that you think are either sort of super problematic or super promising? Well, I don't know if I can speak directly to that question, but I, we are sort of working out our own little 
um, COVID theory um, in terms of how we're making our assumptions about our pro forma for this next acquisition in West Oakland. Um, and sort of trying to use this opportunity to solve a political problem um, that's been um, holding for quite some time for Black communities in that um, Black communities are, for the most part, driven indoors, um, despite, in some ways, I'm sure this is arguable, depending on the theories you speak to, in some ways being a public culture and really thriving from um, public association in, in public space. And, I, and in both the groups, I talked a bit about the, the current sort of contradiction of so-called public space actually being commodified space. And then if you're considered a member of a marginalized community that doesn't have the resources that entitle you to be in that public private space, that commodity space, then you're going to be in some ways to use sort of an inflammatory term, but um, sanitized from that space. So now we're in a moment where um, sh shifts, particularly in the ground level commercial landscape, um, are really um, crippling commercial spaces. Um, and we're wondering if this is an opportunity to reground Black culture into public space, to, to transform this current space. So for example, part of one of the rehabs we wanna do is for one of the ground floor commercial spaces, we wanna build in a roll up garage door for kind of breakout festival space and to create a breezeway from the front wide sidewalk to the back open parking lot to see if we can use that to um, sort of create a, a spatial environment that is not only more appealing but encouraging of, of Black public association again in a way that not only creates uh, more foot traffic to come see what's happening down there but also um, attempts to remediate some of that ways that Black folks are driven from public space by dint of their very existence. So it's, you know, it's risky, um, but you could, you know, the only missed shots are the ones not taken. So that's where we're at right now with that. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that, um, you know, there, there's so much that we we can't, we don't know and things are playing out in different ways and and policy decisions are going to impact um what happens you know like if if the eviction moratorium if there had not been a you know a furthering of an eviction moratorium then the real estate market would look probably look very different today um and you know there are all these interventions that are happening and there's chaos happening in washington um and in california because of the you know, a whole host of reasons. And so there's so many different factors, but I think that, you know, with these acute moments of shock, whether it is a uh, natural uh, hazard event, whether it is a pandemic, whether it's an economic group crisis, um, or whether, you know, in this moment, it's all three, um, you know, there are, there are opportunities that are created and those opportunities um, can be seized by one group or another. And so I, I, I really enjoyed being part of this, um, some of these uh, planning sessions because it gives, you know, a, a space to imagine what could happen and then to prepare for those different scenarios. Um, and, you know, maybe I, I think just as someone who's actually been looking for an apartment in Oakland for the past month, um, it's been interesting to see, um, well, first of all, apartment hunting and during a pandemic is very strange, but, but to meet people coming from San Francisco who are kind of fleeing the city um, and looking for a different way to interact with space, um, to have more of it, something that, you know, many parts of Oakland do have more space. Um, and then also knowing people, uh, having friends in San Francisco who are leaving the area because they don't want to deal with, um, the, the fires and, and the pandemic and, and don't have roots in the area. Um, I think that's also an, an interesting way in which, you know, the people who, like myself, who were born and raised in the Bay Area, like, I want to stay in the Bay Area for the rest of my life. Um, and I'm very tied to, um, to that place. And so, you know, the, the ways that 
that we adapt or that, that people are driven to adapt to a place because of that sense of, and in my group we talked about adaptation and managed retreat. Um, and I think that like how we, um, how we interact with our space and choose to interact with the space that is in a constant state of flux is the challenge that we face right now. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens in the coming months and years. And I, I hope that with, you know, conversations like this and like the scenario planning that EB Prec was doing, I, you know, I, again, I think disasters, these moments of acute shock create um, openings and opportunities. And it is usually those with capital, those who have the, the capacity and the resources to be, to adapt, um, to be adaptable and shift their strategy largely because they have capital. Those are the ones who usually take advantage of these moments. Um, I think what's, what's been interesting about the virus is that it is like this kind of is very slow moving disaster that is very much impacting people's lives. But, you know, the fact that we, the disaster means we have to go inside and can be connected by um, the internet and have these conversations, I, I hope it means that we, it gives us some time and space to respond in a way that is more strategic and ultimately advances a, um, uh, you know, especially in the housing space, advances uh, more housing that is more affordable to folks in the Bay Area. Yeah, I wanted to, if I could say one more thing about that, um, to stack on what Alex is saying about folks who have the capital or maybe even just the um, sort of social power, the social capital to capitalize, I'm redundant, on this moment, um, where you're looking at a lot of, of businesses, for example, downtown, who are now occupying full space in the street, where like Webster and Grand is blocked off for folks to go watch the Warriors outside. When in contrast to the, the dynamics I was discussing a few minutes ago, is that uh, crowds of black folks outside hasn't really been a thing. I, I guess there are moments, but in general, it hasn't really been a thing. And it, it evokes suspicion, um, resistance, policing, um, even internal conflict within the community, right? Um, because of fear, et cetera. Um, so Alex is, 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 is acutely right that this is gonna be a really interesting moment to see what cracks we can lever open further um, to offer opportunity to folks who haven't had an opportunity to um, engage in a, shift, a shifting landscape, the shifting grounds, if you will, of what space can be used for or should be used for and who can be there and in what manner they can be in that space. Um, Yeah, that's fascinating, Noni. You know, um, Maya was talking about um, when we were talking about, you know, jurisdictions and how um, space and even, you know, what's perceived as public space is sort of regulated by, you know, overlapping jurisdictions. And, you know, the pandemic has been uh, allowed, you know, certain gaps or, or um, sort, you know, kind of flexibility in, um, in use and, and, uh, design, you know, in that space. Um, and, you know, for instance, allowing commercial use of what was, you know, public space, um, the restaurant putting its tables out on the sidewalk or, you know, the shop putting its goods out, you know, on the sidewalk or on the street. Um, and, and, you know, it begs the question of the flip side of that, you know, on the other side of the property line, um, does that, you know, also allow um, more, you know, public uses of that, you know, private space, you know, is there is a way that that same gap or that same uh, lapse can be exploited, 
you know, to, um, you know, put property to a use other than, um, uh, you know, creating wealth, um, but, you know, something like creating social infrastructure, like you're talking about Noni with the, you know, turning that, that shop into a, you know, a, a community event space that, that, that produces social infrastructure, doesn't produce profit. And I think, I think all, all these, you know, I mean, I think what's cutting across a lot of these conversations is this, you know, how these moments of exception or spaces of exception are, are potentially allowing um, this kind of, you know, more radical experimentation and, and thinking to, to happen. And actually, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, ask for forgiveness, not for permission um, happening. <laughs> No, I think it's worth saying here that um, all this occurs within um, a context of sort of modalities of urban and municipal governance. And so I'm really interested in the radical municipalism sort of movement, looking at how cities might actually reorient their goals less toward capturing profit and business and a tax base and more toward serving social needs, which is what arguably cities are really fundamentally there for. Um, and you know, I think this 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 lends a bit more uh, nuance to like the redlining discussion. Like redlining was about consolidating capital and profit to a specific class. And I think you know, if we start talking about something like greenlining, maybe that's making explicitly cities explicitly designating policy to make space for social uses and social practices in the city that are more bottom up. Um, and I, yeah, I love this idea that we can you know, we might use this sort of instability of our current moment to um, try to re-inscribe people in cities who we policed out of them. Um, I think that seems really important and really fruitful. Um, I think we need lots and lots of things like that, but it'll all work much better if we have cities and city governments that understand that social mission and understand that actually profit isn't the only, profit and budgets aren't the only thing that matter. And a connection back between that kind of governance and the communities that live there to go back to Noni's earlier point about representation and self governance. It's really beautifully said. Can I, um, I wanted to kind of throw out a slightly more general question onto the table. Um, I guess if we started this conversation around property it might be useful to end with property as well. Um, so I was just curious, you know, when you look back over you know, every one of you probably had that moment where you had to start by looking through all the various property definitions and types that are on our concept board, right? And now that we've completed this process um, of talking through it together and so on, do you look back and say, you know, these are the attitudes towards property that I am really interested in promoting, you know, or are there certain ones that you feel are kind of a, you know, a dead end or have been less productive in some way? Um, so for example, I mean, I'm seeing Eric in your comment, this question of the relationship between government ownership and private or, or smaller collective ownership. Um, you know, or I'm also seeing a lot of themes about the kind of misalignment between um, like, like that idea of following the food and following the maintenance of landscapes in contrast to very fixed political boundaries. So I'm not quite sure if these are the right themes to tease out, but what do you think about property in the end? Um, where should we just eradicate it? Or where is it still useful for us? Um, one thing that, that Noni said um, in, in our first session that, that I've been sitting with, um, well, I, don't, I don't know if I'm gonna, quote you Noni, uh, right? But, um, and, and this just came up with this uh, idea of um, the commons versus public space and how um, the commons is this really like a shared understanding of, or like a shared, a real shared space where everyone comes to the commons and we bring ourselves and, and we exist as ourselves. Whereas public space in the way that we have uh, cut it up and you know they're like pri privately owned public spaces that like um, where people are still in public but policed and, and particularly in the way that black folks are policed in public um, and what Noni has been talking about is uh, a privately owned space that is um, as a commons but I think 
what, what came to mind is the like the ability for a collective to own a private space and within that private space to create kind of to redefine what like what is what the rules are in that space and and in many ways to define liberation and to create utopia right if we if we want to live in um you know a better world and, and i think right now in this moment where there are we we're, there are all these opportunities that are arising in ways in which things are moving and yet you know public space is where we are having these protests and where we are people are being met with violent militias and there is this you know this opportunity and fear that happens in public and so to be able to have space that is in reality private but definable and shared collectively i think is is just I don't know that's not necessarily new but it's it's hitting me in a different way um and um you know who what the the boundaries that we draw around who is in ownership of that space and who gets to define those rules around expression and, and liberation is a conversation in and of itself and um could lead to, to problems as well but um i just that, that's something that came up to me and was particularly striking about how private space can be a liberating space if it's shared collectively. Um, for me, I would love to see a, maybe a greater understanding of the collectiveness of our experiences, how one thing that's being done over here impacts people over here. Um, one thing that we see in nature, the teachings of nature, is that you can't put something in a vacuum because everything is connected. And to treat it like it isn't connected is to um, create an equation that does not accurately represent reality. And so we see this talking about watersheds, that what people do up at the top of the watershed affects the people at the bottom. And what the people at the bottom do affects the people at the top. And so I, um, I'm not a land use planning professional, uh, but I wonder if there is an expanded opportunity now that we see that we share our disease transmission, that we share our air, that we share our resources in a way that we are now just really starting to viscerally understand uh, if there is an appetite for looking at a more collective accountability of land use and management. Adam, I'm just going to call on you <laughs> because I want to know what you're thinking. Um, do you have any general perspectives on the, the large spectrum of property? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, a lot of like un, un, not fully formed thoughts through my head. Um, and like, I just, I really enjoyed this afternoon's workshop and like talking um, with the folks I was paired with and the students. And I, I think it's like, I don't know, a really compelling model, Jeanette, um, that um, maybe wouldn't be as possible in person, if that makes sense, <laughs> what we've, what we've, this kind of conversation. So, um, but I don't know, th there were a few threads that, that I think have come through um, in the conversations I was a part of today. Um, one is, is an idea that I think he's coming up in different ways, whether you're thinking about it in terms of the pandemic or climate crisis or, um, you know, social um, unrest and, and so on, is this idea of like ways that space or architecture can provide opportunities for or promote kinship. Um, and that word can be thought of in many different ways, whether it's like between people, right, um, who might not otherwise be um, connected in some way, or between people and ecological actors, environments. Um, and I think that that, for me as an architect, is like a compelling way of like, um, uh, like bringing it down to like 
um, actionable strategies that that architects can can grapple with. Um, because yeah, like I'm not I, I don't have the kind of like policy chops um, and uh, urban planning chops. Um, but but we are able to kind of think about connecting connections like in the way Noni that you were talking about that roll up garage door, um, which is like such a simple device, but it, but potentially with such powerful um, implications, right? And so I think that I love that idea, and I also loved um, the the metaphor of like the crack, the cracks that uh, that you pointed out. Like I think like partially it's partly identifying the cracks like where are there cracks um, that we can act upon and then once you've identified them like how can you pry them open um, in the, in these systems and I think that's um, that's something I've seen in like all, I think all of the strategies um, that came across today um, and you know the other thought I had um, I don't know if I, I don't I haven't fully thought this through yet, but the pandemic seems um, in a way to, because every human more or less is vulnerable <laughs> to this risk, it seems to like potentially that it might have a more um, like comprehensive impact in the way that Colleen was talking about in terms of like like challenging people to reconsider their what they value um, or what what one values um, and that could be in terms of property but also just in terms of like how people want to live their life um, and I don't know we'll see how it pans out but I think um, you know it because it's it's it it has a much more um, you know, life-threatening impact on, on anyone than like, let's say climate change, which many people still um, are insulated from. I wonder if it, if it might catalyze a much larger kind of reassessment of value in general. Um, and that I think, like I'm, I'm sure inspired, partially inspired the studio and this, this event, this symposium. Um, and so I think it's really timely conversation. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate that. And I think I th that's actually a really wonderful way to wrap up our session because you're able to make that translation between these really big questions that we're all talking about today and the, the tools that we have as designers. So I really appreciate you bringing that back. Um, we've done it. Three hours have gone by. <laughs> um, thank you so much for weathering all of our uncertainties today as well as in general. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your insight with us. Um, I'll be in touch. I'll, I'll, share, I'll come back and share with you the results of the studio and the seminar. Um, so I hope we keep talking. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. It was amazing. Thanks everyone. Great to meet yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you. Internet.